A Brooklyn native and New York City public school product, Dr. King earned his undergraduate degree in government at Harvard University. His teacher's college master's and doctoral degrees in, respectively, the teaching of social studies and educational administrative practice, and his law degree from Yale University. After teaching high school social studies, he co-founded the Roxbury Preparatory Charter School, where students attain the highest state exam scores of any urban middle school in Massachusetts. He subsequently became managing director for the Uncommon Schools, which won the 2013 Broad Prize for Top Charter Network. Appointed New York State's Education Commissioner in 2011, Dr. King established New York as a national leader in implementing Common Core State Standards Initiative and championed the creation of the Strengthening Teacher and Leader Effectiveness Grants Program. In 2016, Dr. King was appointed the U.S. Secretary of Education by President Barack Obama. He oversaw the rollout of the Every Student Succeeds Act and announced a $12 million grant competition to give school districts the opportunity to craft new roadmaps for increasing student diversity. In February 2017, Dr. King became president and CEO of the Education Trust, which works to close the opportunity gaps for students of color and those from low-income families. He since forcefully urged Congress to strengthen the Pell Grant program, maintain funding for development of teachers and school leaders, and support increased diversity in America's teaching force. Dr. King, welcome. We are so pleased that you could join us for our new student orientation. Thanks so much for the opportunity to join you. It's so wonderful that you could be here. So as, as promised, I'd like to start out with um, a discussion about equity and inequity, and in particular, your experiences growing up. So what did you experience growing up and coming of age? How did your experiences shape your views of what children need and what education can and can't do? And what perspective did it give you on racial disparities in America? Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for um, framing the, con the conversation this way. You know, I very much my career in education is tied to my own experience in the New York City public schools as a kid. Uh, both my parents were New York City public school educators. Uh, my dad, who is African-American, grew up in uh, New York City just after the turn of the 20th century in a very segregated New York and saw a path to opportunity as a teacher and administrator. Uh, my mom was born in Ponce in Puerto Rico, came to New York as a kid, uh, learned English in the New York City public schools. Uh, went to Hunter College in the CUNY system, a, a sort of classic New Yorkian story of, um, of a journey from uh, growing up in the Bronx to um, becoming a teacher and then a school counselor. She was actually the school counselor in my elementary school. Uh, so I say I was very well behaved in elementary school. Um, so both my parents gave their whole lives uh, to the New York City public schools, but they couldn't have known the difference that New York City public schools would make in my life. Uh, they both passed away when I was a kid. Um, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. My mom passed away in, in October of fourth grade, and I was um, in uh, the class member teacher, Mr. Osterweil, who was my teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, he actually looped with us. And he saved my life. If I had not been in his classroom, I don't know that I'd be alive today. Maybe, I, maybe I'd be in prison. I mean, his, his classroom changed my life trajectory. Because after my mom passed, it was just my dad and me. My dad was sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. And so home was this place that was scary and inconsistent and unstable. Uh, I didn't know what my father would be like from one night to the next. But school in Mr. Osterwald's classroom was a source of stability, consistency. It was a space that was nurturing, challenging, academically rigorous. Um, we did uh, all kinds of stuff in that class. And I remember like it was yesterday, we read the New York Times every day, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We did productions of... Uh, Alice in Wonderland and Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, Shakespeare in elementary school. Uh, 
he was the kind of teacher who, when you finished a book, he was there with the next. When you finished a math problem, he was there with another that was a little more challenging. Uh, he made school this place that was so compelling. And we went to the ballet and the museum, and, and he showed us this whole world beyond uh, Canarsie, Brooklyn. And that made a huge difference for me, as my, especially as my father got more and more sick. Um, by the time I was in middle school, when I was in uh, seventh grade at Mark Twain Junior High School in Coney Island, my father was very sick. I was figuring out how to get food in our house, just how to keep our, keep our household going. Um, and then my father uh, passed and I moved around after that, different family members, different schools, but it was always teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose. But we'll say, you know, it's not a straight line. And, and in high school, like many kids who experience trauma at young ages, I got in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, I was very angry as a high school student, angry uh, at my parents, although that may be irrational. I was angry at adults, just angry at the world. Uh, I got in so much trouble, I got kicked out of high school. Uh, I always tell people I'm the first U.S. Secretary of Education to be kicked out of high school. Um, but I was very fortunate that folks gave me a second chance, right? That there were teachers and a school counselor and some family members who saw more hope and possibility in me than I saw in myself and were willing to give me a second chance. And that allowed me to get on track and to, to go on to become a teacher. So my journey is very much about the difference that schools can make in kids' lives. And so I've always been uh, laser focused on issues of education equity because I know school saved my life. I know that it can be that difference for kids. And I know that we have a lot of work to do as a country to make sure the kinds of opportunities that save my life are available to all kids in all communities, regardless of race or zip code. So, so that, that sort of personal journey and equity are very much bound up together, but I also am very conscious that I was a beneficiary of second chances and that in many ways we do not do a good job as a, as a country giving second chances to young people. In fact, we have young people in juvenile justice facilities all over the country who um, made a mistake. And the way we've set up our, our criminal justice system, we, we're, we're prepared as a country to throw their lives away because of a mistake they made at 14, 15, 16 years of age. Um, and that could very easily have been me. Um, but people gave me a second chance. And so I also am very focused in, in my work and always have been in both the, the sort of school work, but also the policy work on how, how do we make sure that we're giving young people second chances, opportunities um, to get their life back on track when, when, when things have gotten off on, on the wrong track. Absolutely. I think that's a critical, critical point. So last fall, the Washington Post ran an amazing story about a remarkable discovery that you made about ancestors of yours who were enslaved. Could you recap the story for us first, for those of us who may have missed the article, but also share your reflections on what all of us need to learn about the legacy of slavery and your thoughts about the matter of reparations for descendants of enslaved African-Americans? Sure. So, um... I was invited to give the uh, commencement address at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So a historically black college out on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And I was invited in part because my grandmother graduated from there in 1894. My goodness. And um, in preparation for that speech, I started this uh, family history research project. And uh, through a friend, got connected with a woman who uh, is a genealogist, uh, worked with the Schomburg in New York City. And she got interested in the project and wanted to, to be helpful. And she started helping me with this project. And one night I was sitting on the couch with my family and I get this email from her. And it says, hey, I just, want you to know that I've tracked down the property where your great grandfather was enslaved. And it turns out that the um, cabin that he and his family lived in while enslaved still standing on the property. 
and the property is still owned by the family that are direct line descendants of the family that owned your family. So, I mean, it was, I mean, as you know, African Americans know, right, that there is this connection to slavery, but, um, but had no idea uh, that we were going to be able to locate that exact place. It's about 25 miles from where I live. It's right here in, in Montgomery County. And then we started puzzling over, well, you know, how do we introduce ourselves to this family? You know, uh, but my, my cousin, uh, she, she didn't puzzle over it long. She just went and uh, knocked on the door and introduced herself. And that started a relationship that we've now developed with, with the family that, that lives on the property. Um, you know, it's quite a powerful experience to stand in that cabin with my daughters, the cabin where um, my great grandfather was, was enslaved and his family. Um, we've learned amazing stories about their history, the, the family's history on, on the property, including that, uh, you know, Maryland was quite divided during the Civil War. Though Maryland stayed on the Union side, there were many uh, Marylanders who went and uh, fought with the Confederacy including the, the children of the family uh, who owned my family. And in fact, my <clears throat> great-grandfather's sister reported her owners for consorting with the Confederates and testifying against them in a trial in, in Baltimore. So, I mean, just this inspiring history. She, she was 15 when she testified wow. against them. Um, and so that was very inspiring, I think, for my daughters who are teenagers and could see themselves in that story. So we had this amazing experience. We also have gotten to know this family and, and are very conscious that they have been very gracious. Um, but I think it's also been a moment of real learning for them about uh, slavery and its legacy. Um, and we've had some really, um, you know, difficult and um, but important conversations about the institution of slavery. And, and on the whole, the story is a reminder um, of a couple truths about our history. One, that slavery is, defi is a defining element of the American journey, the American experience. Uh, you know, I think about in the city of Boston, where I was a teacher, uh, recent studies show that the median net worth of African American families in Boston is eight dollars. Yeah. Eight. I had to read the headline several times. I thought that must be a typo. No, eight dollars. Mm -hmm. The median net worth of white families in, in Boston is something like two hundred forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And so that racial wealth gap is an extension of the institution of slavery. When we think about the efforts in Florida to use a poll tax, in essence, to keep folks who were previously incarcerated from being able to vote, that is an extension of strategies that were used in the aftermath of the Civil War um, to try to undermine the right to vote for Black men that was granted uh, by, the, by the 15th Amendment. So you, you have very much in this, uh, in our American story, the legacy of slavery. And for me, what reparations is about is really the idea that we have to take active steps to dismantle systemic racism. And that has to be a broad agenda to uh, address how racism infects our economy, our education system, our healthcare system, our criminal justice system. Uh, but the other truth of American history, I think, is also the potential for progress. I and mean, we've gone in my family in four generations from enslavement on that property to my having the privilege to serve in the cabinet of the first African-American president. So there is both in, in America this tension, right, the the, the reality that we have always fallen short of the promise of the Declaration of Independence and the reality that we have also always been in, in a work in progress, sort of journeying uh, on a journey to, to, to make sure that, that 
that our reality reflects those values. Indeed. So, um, so earlier you mentioned uh, you use the term trauma in reflecting on some of your own experiences. Um, and so it's clear that um, from that story that you deeply understand the impact of trauma. Um, it's been interesting here recently at Teachers College, we have found a real um, core of faculty who are doing research on trauma across the college. Even before the COVID pandemic and the recent wave of police killings of people of color, Many people in education were calling for greater emph emphasis on trauma-informed education. Now that need would seem to be exponentially perhaps greater. How should and how can schools respond and how much can they realistically accomplish given the budgets that are being slashed as we speak? Do we need a wholesale rethinking of the role in schools um, in the lives of children and families and how would this work going forward with so many schools being online in particular? So sort of trauma in the face of, of COVID-19. Yeah, and there, there, are, there are a lot of pieces there. I think, I, I think where I'd start is that it is important as we prepare teachers, as we think about teacher and administrator professional development, that we grapple with the consequences of trauma in kids' lives that we grapple with the growing body of research around adverse childhood experiences and the long-term impact that they can have on, on kids' lives and their physical well-being. Uh, it's important that we equip teachers, administrators, counselors with skills to support students' resilience, right? With skills to help students um, process the traumatic experiences they've had and also find ways um, to move forward productively in their, in their lives. At the same time, I think we also have to hold in our minds that we not only need to address the consequences of trauma, we need to build a society with less trauma, mm. right? So educators have a responsibility to be part of a broader social movement, I believe, to address economic inequality, to address uh, the lack of access to health care in many communities, to address uh, policies of mass incarceration and the trauma they have inflicted on communities, right? So we have to both uh, learn to support kids through these experiences, which, which you know, cut across lines of race and class, but disproportionately affect low-income students and students of color. But also we have to do more to have a, a society that is more just so that uh, we don't see these disparities in experiences of trauma. Then I would also say we, we have to also center issues of racial equity in our conversations about socio-emotional learning. I do worry that some of the conversation about socio-emotional learning and some of the conversation about trauma-informed practice can seem like it's problematizing kids uh, and, and arguing for fixing kids as opposed to making arguments about fixing systems, mm -hmm. right? And so if you broaden the lens, and that's something we work on at the Education Trust, we just uh, published a paper actually on, the, on this exact topic and made the argument that we've, we've got to do more to, uh, to look at systems. We've got to ask, which of this in this moment uh, where we're having this national reckoning with issues of racial justice, we've got to ask, um, do kids see windows and mirrors in the curriculum? Do they have the opportunity to see themselves reflected in the, in the history, the narrative of history that we present? Do they see themselves reflected in the authors we read, the texts that we study? Because if not, then we're not fully addressing their socio-emotional well-being. Do kids have an opportunity to see themselves reflected in the school staff and school leadership? You know, we have good evidence that shows that uh, for an African-American elementary school student, having just one black teacher in elementary school increases their likelihood of graduating from high school and going on to college. So if we have communities where kids don't ever get to see themselves reflected, and we know that's a problem nationally, majority of our kids are kids of color, only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color, only 2% of our teachers are black men. So if kids aren't seeing themselves reflected in the staff, 
then we aren't doing enough to address their socio-emotional needs. If we have disparate discipline policies where students of color are being uh, suspended and expelled disproportionately, if we have, as we do, more than 15 states that allow corporal punishment, allow the use of a wooden object against a child in an act of state-sanctioned violence, then we're not supporting kids' socio-emotional well-being. So I worry if you're in a school where, where you aren't doing these systemic things, and then you say, but we're going to do a half hour of mindfulness every day. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not real. That's not a real commitment to kids' social, emotional, and academic development. So to do that work well, uh, we have to center issues of racial equity. And that may be uncomfortable, because that may require us then to, to grapple with things like implicit bias. Um, but we have to do, do that work. So, and what do you think about this, um, the, the risk to kids who are learning now from home in, in large part? Well, look, we have, we have big challenges in this moment, um, many of which are self-inflicted, right? I, I, I always try to point out that the challenge we're facing now in schools around COVID didn't have to be this way, right? The federal government made a series of bad decisions. Uh, we lack a coherent national strategy around rapid results testing, contact tracing, quarantine, mask wearing, broad compliance with public health recommendations. In the absence of a coherent national strategy, we have rampant community spread of COVID that's forcing school closures going into this school year. Now, what we know from last school year is that um, we have a challenge around access to the internet. About 79% of white families have reliable internet access, 66% of black families, 61% of Latino families. So we had kids who literally had the schoolhouse door barred for them because they didn't have internet access. We had a challenge around devices. It's not just a device in the house. It's does every kid have a device on which they can do their work simultaneously in the household. We had a challenge around professional development and support for teachers, particularly in high needs districts that don't have the resources. We had a challenge around parental support. Only one in five uh, black folks in the workforce can work from home. Only one in six Latinos in the workforce can work from home. So many kids were home with older sibling or another family member and didn't necessarily have that parent support. And we had a challenge of sort of socio-emotional isolation, right? I, you know, for me as a kid, being away from school for months would have been a disaster. And so I worry a lot about kids who are in homes where there's health-related trauma because of COVID, economic trauma because of the COVID-induced economic crisis, um, kids who are in homes where there's addiction or domestic violence or abuse, right? and they're isolated. So we have all these challenges. And because we don't have a coherent federal response to the pandemic, we're going to see those challenges extend into this school year as many school districts choose uh, distance learning or, or hybrid learning. So we know there's going to be an academic cost. Uh, the McKinsey study suggests that it's an average of seven months of, of unfinished learning, of learning loss from last school year, nine months for Latino students, 10 months for Black students. But we also know there's a social emotional toll on kids and family. Uh, so, you know, it, there's just, there's no other word than to say it's been devastating, the impact of COVID on kids' education and well being, not to mention food insecurity. A recent study suggested 40% of Black and Latino families are struggling to get food reliably to their kids. 14 million food insecure kids in America. So we, we I think, need leadership at every level, federal, state, local, teachers in the classroom. We need every level of leadership to try to respond to the, the urgent crisis that we face as a country. Yeah, uh, so tough to think about uh, all the families and children who are struggling. Um, so we're going to turn to some slightly more controversial questions, perhaps. 
Um, so over the past 30 years, the United States has gone through a series of escalating efforts to institute more uniform academic standards and increase testing and assessment. Leaders such as yourself carried out these measures under the banner of equity in the United States as a way of ensuring that as a bygone federal law once had it, no ch children would be left behind. These measures came under heavy criticism from teachers, teachers unions, uh, faculty members from schools of education, including this one, and parents. From your perspective and with the benefit of hindsight, how effective would you say this approach has been? Um, and then also some thinking about this in the context of COVID in terms of what we've learned when there was no standardized testing because of uh, the abrupt end to the school year. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, worth, it's worth putting this in some historical context. We have to remember that before No Child Left Behind, and No Child Left Behind certainly had its had its challenges, and you know we replaced it in the Obama administration with, with Every Student Succeeds Act. But pre No Child Left Behind, there were communities where they literally didn't count their groups of students that were lowest performing, where they rendered, for example, English learners invisible, where they would report their results only for kids who spoke English at home and ignore the outcomes for English learners. So there was, I think, an important effort in No Child Left Behind and in that era to say, we actually have to look at the performance of all groups of students, that we need to ask, our, how are English learners doing? How are students with disabilities doing? How are our students of color doing? That we have to be honest and have an honest assessment of where students are. That was important. It was also important to say schools matter. Schools make a difference in kids' educational outcomes. They don't make all the difference. They're not the only thing that matters, but schools do matter. And so we ought to ask how we organize our schools to get opportunity to our students, particularly those who've been historically underserved. You know, I think what, what we ought to acknowledge about this period is that um, alongside these efforts to address accountability for equity, there was, I think, too little investment in capacity building, uh, too little investment in capacity building around high quality curriculum, too little investment in capacity building around teacher training and professional development, too little commitment to diversifying the teaching profession, uh, too little effort to make sure that we have enough socio-emotional supports in place for kids and families. You think about states that have a ratio of 600 students to one counselor. How could a counselor pro possibly provide adequate support in that context? So there's a real need to make big investments in capacity. Uh, we also have to acknowledge, I think, that as a country, we still have not grappled with the fundamental question of Brown versus Board of Education. Indeed, in many communities around the country, schools are more segregated by race and by class today than they were even 10 years ago. Uh, so we've been going really in the wrong direction around that. And so one of our challenges is to kind of reject the idea that just looking at um, standards and assessment alone is going to be enough to produce the change we want, which isn't to say it isn't important that we have in place um, a clear articulation of what students are expected to know and be able to do. Um, we need that, but it's necessary, not sufficient. We also have to grapple with these resource inequities. We have to grapple uh, with the segregation of of our schools. You know, I think about New York City, where I grew up, where you are. You know, I think about central Brooklyn. Uh, you can go a few blocks between a school that is almost entirely made up of white affluent students and a school that is made up almost entirely of low-income students of color. Blocks apart. And so we know, in fact, that in many parts of New York City, the schools are more segregated than the housing. So that's a choice we've made. So, you know, uh, we have to be 
I think, honest with ourselves that while there is usefulness to being able to identify where there are gaps, um, the real work is uh, capacity building to close those gaps. And that includes taking on the issue of uh, school segregation directly. Great, thank you. In parallel with the emphasis on testing and standards, the past several decades has seen the birth of the charter school movement, the expansion of school vouchers, and the em emergence of school choice as a rallying cry for many poor and minority parents who want the best for their children. Others fear that school choice has become a means for co and cover for vested interests to dismantle public education. So you have a unique perspective on this question, uh, having played a lead role in launching one of the school's most successful charter school organizations, and then serving as a state and national leader in the public school system. Is school choice creating more and better options for America's neediest students? Is it incentivizing the public schools to achieve better performance? Or is it undermining public education? And what, what reforms can or should be put into place to remedy these issues? Yeah. Well, look, you know, I am a fundamental believer in the foundational role of public education in American society. So for me, the question is, how do we ensure public schools with public dollars with public accountability? So I think vouchers are a distraction. They, they are sort of a scheme to redirect resources away from the public sector to the private sector. So, so I think we ought to set that aside as not a part of a serious commitment to public education. That said, uh, when we think about public schools and public school choice, that takes lots of forms. Um, we have to remember that as, as I talked about the issues of segregation, um, whether it's in New York City, uh, there are folks who buy uh, a house in Park Slope. They know if they buy on one corner, they'll be zoned to the school that has largely low-income students of color. But if they buy in the other corner of the block, they'll be zoned to the uh, very elite school with almost all white and affluent students where the PTA raises a huge amount of money for additional art teachers. And so people are exercising choice just with their resources, right? Similarly, people are settling in communities. There are 700 school districts in New York. They largely track lines of race and class around the state. So people are choosing a school district um, and they're using their, their housing dollars to make a public school choice to be in a school that serves exclusively, uh, almost exclusively white and affluent students. And then we have a tax system that's heavily reliant on property taxes to fund schools. And so in many parts of, of the state of New York, as is true in many parts of the country, we're spending significantly more on the students who are most affluent, most privileged, and significantly less on the students who have the highest needs. So for me, the, the role of charters is potentially creating some options within the public school sector, um, particularly for low-income parents and parents of color that they might not otherwise have. Now, that can come in the form of schools that focus on STEM or the arts or Montessori programs or schools that are diverse by design and intentionally draw a diverse student population. And I think that can be a positive contributor, just as the small schools movement and the effort to create uh, within district um, small schools with particular themes can be a positive contributor. Um, and I think we've seen that with charters, particularly in states that have a high bar to get a charter, rigorous oversight of charters, a willingness to close low performers, careful scrutiny of the operations of those charters. Think about Massachusetts, for example. Charters in Boston have been shown in, in, in many studies uh, to be having a very positive impact on academic performance and uh, long-term college going uh, for their students. So that's positive. On the other hand, we have states like Michigan, which you know. Uh, Michigan has a disastrous 
charter law. And, you know, Secretary DeVos and, and her um, uh, grantees were very active uh, before she became secretary in uh, ensuring a law in Michigan uh, that has resulted in a proliferation of low performing for-profit charters um, that to my mind detract from public education and in many cases are harming students and families because of their terrible outcomes. So charters mean uh, very different things in different states, you know, the charter sector in Massachusetts versus the charter sector in Michigan, just radically different because the law is structured in a radically different way. But to my mind, we need a lot more uh, systems that look like Massachusetts or New York State has also a, a rigorous oversight of the charter sector, um, New Jersey, uh, rather than the, the Michigan model, which has, has not served the state well at all. Yes, having having lived through and seen some of the outcomes, uh, truly devastating to a lot of uh, school districts. So what opportunities has your current uh, position heading the Education Trust giving you to address many of these issues that we've just laid out? Yeah, well, thanks for asking that. So the Education Trust, we, you know, we do education civil rights work. We are, uh, doing a mix of research and advocacy. Um, we are doing a mix of federal and state policy work. Uh, so we are in all these fights uh, and in both um, P through 12 and higher ed. Uh, some recent examples, um, we just published a paper, uh, segregation forever, question mark. And that paper looks at the representation of students of color in selective admission public institutions. And as you know, what that paper finds is that as you look across the country, there's not a single state where the percentage of black and Latino students at their selective admission public colleges matches the percentage of black and Latino young adults 18 to 24, not a single state. And in fact, in a majority of cases, the percentage of black students in selective public admission colleges has gone down over the last 20 years. So these are institutions that have as their mission serving the population of the state, but for a complicated set of reasons, sometimes having to do with systematic disinvestment by state government in those institutions, uh, sometimes having to do with admissions policies like the ban on affirmative action in California, uh, sometimes having to do with financial aid policies, but so a mix of reasons, but the reality is Students of color are underrepresented in those institutions, and that has to change. And so we, we then offer a set of policy recommendations, and then we advocate with state legislatures and with Congress to try to address that. Um, we did another paper, a series of papers recently that we, that we published with Heckinger on the issue of black student debt. Black students mm -hmm. are uh, more likely to borrow. When they do borrow, they borrow more and they are more likely to default. And that's tied up with the issues of the racial wealth gap that we talked about earlier. There are specific policy strategies we could put in place. You mentioned in the intro, Pell Grant advocacy. Well, the Pell Grant program is our main vehicle to subsidize higher education for low-income students. In 1980, uh, Pell Grants accounted for nearly 80% of the cost of, of public four-year colleges. Today, it's down to 28%. My goodness. So the diminished value, purchasing value of the Pell Grant has translated directly into increased burden on low-income students to borrow to pay for college. And that has had a uh, disparate impact on Black students who carry this additional debt. Well, there are public policy solutions. We can increase Pell Grants. We could implement, as part of our COVID relief efforts, systematic debt forgiveness, um, particularly for, for low-income folks, right? We, we have policy levers, we have to choose to use them. In the K-12 space, we did a paper recently on inequitable access to advanced coursework. And we found that there are really two dynamics at play. Um, schools with large numbers of students of color are less likely to offer AP classes, for example, 
or uh, gifted and talented programs at the elementary level. But we also found that even in schools that do offer those programs, students of color are underrepresented in those programs, right? They're not getting access to those AP classes in their high schools. So you have schools that are uh, integrated at the doorway, but segregated in the hallway, where you can walk down the hall and, and in the remedial class, you see the students of color. In the AP class, you see the white students. It doesn't have to be that way. We have to have a set of policies in place to address those kinds of opportunity gaps. So the, that's the kind of work we do at Ed Trust, kind of continuously making the case uh, with the data on opportunity gaps that we have to change our public policy to be uh, true to our values around education as a, as a pathway to social mobility and equitable opportunity. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I draw a lot of inspiration from our, our work because it's the work we need to do to build a more just society. Sounds like a, a fantastic mission. Um, so of course we're here for our new students and I think they would love to hear something about what your TC education has, has facilitated in your life. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, a, a couple of things. One is, uh, student teaching was amazing. Um, and I will say, you know, there were a lot of things I liked about my master's program, but, but the thing that made the biggest difference was that I spent all day, uh, every day in, in, in school, uh, at Beacon High School in, in, in Manhattan and, uh, had amazing cooperating teachers who, uh, helped me learn how to teach. And so I'm very grateful for that experience. I loved being a high school social studies teacher. I still teach now. I teach undergrads at, at University of Maryland. Uh, I just, you know, got to see great teaching in those classrooms and uh, learned so much from that experience. In my doctoral program, it really was a community of folks who were principals, assistant superintendents, superintendents, policymakers who were grappling with um, really challenging, interesting issues, particularly around issues of equity. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from my classes, had some uh, amazing uh, professors like Jay Hubert, for example, um, but I, Luis Huerta, uh, but I also um, had the, the benefit of a community of peers who are grappling with really similar questions and who I could bounce ideas off of. At the time I started that program, I was a principal. And so I just learned a lot that helped me be better at my job as a principal and that have certainly informed my work as a policymaker and, and made some very important personal and professional relationships with, with classmates that, that still shape my life today. Wonderful. Well, Dr. King, thank you so much for this discussion and for your continued involvement with Teachers College. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.